And then the talk tonight is by uh, Michael Marty. Now, Michael um, moved to Newcastle in 1991 um, to join the university, well, to join the newly merging University of Newcastle and um, was uh, then joined the uh, Department of uh, Environmental and, uh, and Life Sciences. And um, I think, uh, or Biological and Life Sciences, maybe as it was at the time. Um, and, um, well, I think we'll hear um, something about what, what his interests are um, shortly. So, thank you, Michael. Thanks very much, George. Um, and thank you to the Royal Society um, for the very kind invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and it's good to see some former students. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm not sure whether that's good or not, but anyhow. <laughs> um, so uh, John Aitken wrote to me and asked whether I would talk about conservation frogs and the citizen scientist. Um, so it's um, sometimes it's um, when you're given a topic, you think, yeah, that's okay. And then when you start to write it, you go, hmm, okay. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of this uh, sort of thing and it's a little bit different to talking about the hard science, I suppose. Um, but it's sort of enjoyable because it's such a nice broad topic. So, conservation frogs and the citizen science scientist. Um, just to start off with, I'll, I'll take you through a bit of the diversity of Australian frogs so that um, you have an understanding. And what we know is that Australia really is a land apart because of its isolation for at least 50 million years since it last shared a border with um, Antarctica and then with South America and the supercontinent Gondwana. And, and that really defines Australia biologically. Um, and we know that what we've got in almost all of our fauna is unique, um, from the marsupials to, you know, the, the greatest songbirds um, on the planet, to um, amazing reptiles, of which the geckos are a very ancient group, and of course our frogs. And so for a biologist, Australia really is a natural laboratory of evolution. And um, once again, that pretty much defines a large amount of what biologists do. Um, so what about our frogs? Um, we have um, really four groups. One of them can be, well, not dismissed, but we have one, what are called in taxonomy, true frogs of the genus Rana or the family Ranidae, the frogs of the Northern Hemisphere and most of Asia, Southeast Asia, are dominated by the edible frogs of the world, Rana. And we have one species in Oz which um, is also found in New Guinea and Southeast Asia and it's a recent hop across Torres Strait. Not brought here, naturally in the top end and in Cape York. Um, and then we have the micro tree frogs and there are only 24 species of those and they are also shared with New Guinea which has something of the order of 300 species of micro tree frog. So we've just got in our rainforest on Cape York, and once again in the top end near, near Darwin, some micro tree frogs. And then the other two groups, what we call by the common name tree frogs and ground frogs, are what are also called the old endemics. So the ground frogs, there are 140 species. The tree frogs, there are about 94 species in Australia. Um, and of course, totally 260 frogs or thereabouts. Um, species of frog, and for a continent the size of Australia, this is not a large number. There are 800 species of frog in New Guinea, and it's a much smaller uh, island than ourselves. Um, and so, and if we looked at South America, where this, I think it's more like close to 800 or 900 species, Australia is not particularly great. And there's a reason for that, um, as we know, um, Australia is also the driest continent if we ignore Antarctica. Um, and that 70% of Australia is semi-arid or arid. And frogs need water. And there's no frog in the world that's escaped needing water. All frogs and all salamanders, their close relatives, have moist skin 
and breathe through their skin and have lungs. And the majority of them have external fertilization, which needs water for the sperm to swim to the egg. Um, there are one or two frogs in the world that have internal fertilization, um, none in Australia. So water is a critical component for frogs. So, well, you think, well, okay, that's why we haven't got a lot of species. But what the Australian frogs have done have, has been a valiant fight to deal with aridity and the growing aridity, particularly in the last 30 million years as the Australian continent dried. Because it was once covered with rainforest and, and wet forest. Um, and so on the right hand side there, that's um, near the Stirling Ranges in Western Australia and sand plains for hundreds and hundreds of square kilometres. Not even a pond of water. And if it rained, it's all sand and the water just goes into the ground. So what do the frogs do? We end up with this little frog here, which uh, has the common name, the turtle frog. Of course, the first biologists and most kids in Perth who see one of these thing, things think it's a baby turtle. This, the Western Australian Museum often gets people phoning up saying, we've got a baby turtle in our backyard and it's got no shell. And here it is. This is the turtle frog. And what does it do about aridity? Living in a place where there's no streams and no even ponds, it goes underground. That's why it's got those nice big digging front feet. It goes underground and then it's got to change its reproduction. No longer going to have tadpoles, builds a nest, puts its eggs inside this little, just a nest, it's a hollow in the ground, down at the groundwater where the aquifer is, where it is wet, it lays its eggs and its tadpoles develop completely inside the egg capsule. It doesn't lay a thousand eggs, can't do that. Only 20 or 30 eggs, puts a lot of energy into them so that they can make it right through the tadpole stage inside an egg capsule and hatch out. An amazing adaptation to deal with aridity. Um, we, we go to the desert and we ask ourselves, well, not surprising. I said 70% of Australia is semi-arid, close to 50% is sand desert. And where does a frog live in this sort of environment? And there are frogs that have survived and adapted to live in this sort of environment. Uh, this is a pair of um, near Batrachus or desert burrowing frogs. This is a sort of um, clay pen they breed in when it does rain in the desert. Amazing frogs. You could spend a whole lecture just talking about the physiology of an animal that doesn't need to come to the surface for three to six years. If the rain doesn't come, it just stays in dormancy. It can cut its heart rate down to 20% of the natural rate. It can do all sorts of things with its solutes so that it doesn't become toxic to itself as it metabolises. Um, and it forms an amazing thing called a cocoon, um, covers itself in its own skin that it, it extrudes comes like a plastic bag and it maintains its moisture and it can do that for up to six years. And when the rains come, the very night it rains, it hits the surface and breeds. Within 24 hours, an amazing frog. And I suppose I started my, my excursion into frogs um, with this frog. Um, and it's got one of the greatest evolutionary adaptations amongst Australian frogs, if you sort of balance these things up. This is a polyploid. Um, it, it doubled its whole genome, whole genome duplication. It went from 24 chromosomes to 48. And how that makes it become an animal that can survive dormancy for so long is related to that. Um, and it's only the second Australian frog now to have its whole genome sequenced. Um, we've just published that and um, it's got some amazing things in its transcriptome for those of you who think about those things. So when it's wet, um, like on the East Coast, and we, we do have wet forests, which frogs love, once again, even here, the Australian frogs have done different things. Um, this is uh, a bog frog. This is the male sitting here. And these are his tadpoles which you'll never see. So the leaf litter has been pulled off the top of this, and in fact, even some of the dirt. 
So these frogs live in this in incredibly wet place. There's plenty of creeks, but they're fast flowing. They're not good places for frogs. So they, it's wet enough that they just dig a hole, create a nest in the forest ground, and that's where they lay their clutch of eggs. And their tadpoles develop um, completely inside the nest. Um, then we go a step even further to this amazing little frog, and I mean little, this is about the size of your thumbnail. This is Asa Darlingtoni, the hip pocket frog. It lays its eggs on the forest floor. The eggs hatch out and its tadpoles wriggle up into pouches on its side. It's the one of only four amphibians in the world that has male parental care. It's dad who looks after the tadpoles for about 40 days in pouches on his, on his side. No nutrition is provided. There's no placentation. The yolk of the, of the egg, and you can see there in the early embryo, is sufficient for tadpole development, um, even in his pouches, until metamorphosis. So while Australian frogs faced aridity and also stayed in the ancient forests on the east coast, um, their evolution involved incredible adaptations to dealing with the Australian environment, which we see nowhere else in the world, by and large. Um, and then there's sort of the, the piste de resistance. Um, and this is the only case of gastric brooding in any animal. So we have one Australian frog or two species where the female, we don't know whether she swallowed the eggs or the early tadpoles, somehow or other they got into her stomach. She turns her stomach into a brood sac. The muscles of the stomach wall are uh, completely degraded by the hormones produced by the eggs. There's no gastric secretion that's turned off once again by the secretion of the eggs. And then after about 40 days of brooding, she gives oral birth. Um, and once again, the physiology of this, uh, uh, part of legend, because legend, because this frog is extinct. Two species, both extinct. And that brings us to our consideration of the conservation issues. And I, I don't want to make it all sound so, so disastrous. We don't have to go far from here to the Barrington Range or the Central Coast Range. And um, streams like this, this is actually at um, Gloucester Tops, just out on the bottom of the Barrington Range near Gloucester. And we just see wonderful frogs um, along our streams. They're beautiful frogs. Uh, and uh, by and large, for some of them, there's plenty of them. They're doing fine. But for some, they're not. So for a frog biologist, our natural laboratory is still there. And we have this incredible diversity of body form and reproductive biology and physiology, all of which make being a frog biologist incredibly interesting. Um, and so what has happened in terms of our diversity? Um, uh, this frog, uh, a mountain mist frog, is now listed as critically endangered in the last five years. Um, and the main reason now is climate change and fire that threatens a frog like that, which is not far from us. Once again, in the mountains not far behind us, in the Wadigan Range, this most bizarre frog. Um, um, Andrew did his PhD on this, Andrew there. Um, it's about the size of a tennis ball, bit of a squeezed up, like a nice sized frog. Um, but once again, currently, looking to go onto the endangered list. And really, we don't know why for this frog, except after the fires, the mega fires of 2019 and 20, we did a large amount of work on this frog. And essentially, we couldn't find it in you know, more than half the sites where we used to know it from historical records. I can talk about that a little bit later on, but we're not quite sure what's going on. Is it just that we can't detect the frog and there are some issues with that? or is it really um, undergoing a decline? There should be no way a burrowing frog would be affected by a fire. Well before the fire came, it was hot and dry. These guys should have been 30 centimetres under the ground. They shouldn't have even faced a fire, but something's going on. Um, common things like this, Wilcox's frog, 
probably the most common stream frog um, along the east coast um, and right into Newcastle. People get this in, in the suburbs. And this is an example of a micro tree frog from North Queensland, the smallest Australian frog. Comes close to being one of the smallest vertebrates, smaller than your thumb, your, your, your pinky, your little finger's nail. I'm talking about no bigger than five millimetres long. A tiny frog, unfortunately, only occurs above 900 metres in cool temperate rainforest and its habitat is just going off the top of the, the mountain as climate change happens. Almost within 20 years, we've watched that, that habitat decline. It's as quick as that. And just a beautiful frog from North Queensland to round off diversity. So about 60 years ago, um, one of the great um, books of um, environmental science, Rachel Carson's um, Silent Spring. 60 years ago, and what Rachel Carson was writing about was essentially DDT and the problems of too much DDT. It's fascinating. The DDT was being used to control fire ants. And it's a problem for us now in northern New South Wales, fire ants. Um, and that's led in the last, uh, since the 1970s, biologists have been talking about the biodiversity crisis. Before um, climate change became a major topic of discussion, the biodiversity crisis has been front and centre for biologists. Uh, and it's a crisis of extinction. And that crisis is about um, that we, whether geologists all agree or not, some authors are saying and others are saying no, too quick. We are in an epic, as the geologists put life, um, we are, we are now in the epic of man, the Anthropocene, where everything on our planet is essentially now so affected by what we do, clearing climate change, that we are controlling natural processes, just the density of humanity and all of our actions. So we've moved into this new, new um, epic in, in, in the planet's existence, the Anthropocene, and the primary problem with that is what we call the biodiversity crisis. Um, back in um, 1984, E.O. Wilson um, had this to say, and I, I think about this quote so many times because it's actually what's happening right now. Um, you know, we've been through the global financial crisis a little back where conventional war is happening and we hope it doesn't go to nuclear war. Totalitarian governments are moving in all sorts of places. And Wilson said back in 1984, as terrible as these catastrophes would be for us, um, they can be fixed in a few generations and we have and, and probably hope we can for what's happening now. But he said the one process that's going on that will take millions of years, not, not a decade or two, but millions of years to correct is the loss of genetic and species diversity. It's very important that he put in the word genetic diversity because most conservation writing in the public is about species diversity and the great loss is genetic diversity. When we get down to one population and we've lost 20 or 30 others, we are down to depleting um, the, the very fundamental component of evolution the genetic diversity. Um, conservation geneticists go as far as saying, if you got down to the last 500, species might as, be, might as well be extinct. You've lost the genetic diversity that enables a species to evolve and adapt. And our legislation and our planning doesn't deal with that. It deals with the unit of the species, not a unit of genetic diversity. And so um, Wilson said, this is the folly that our descendants will least forgive us in the future, our children's children. And so um, up until about the 1980s, things were pretty much going fine for Australian frogs. And then we came to a global phenomenon um, of amphibian declines being seen around the world. Uh, and Australia um, had a 
sad part in that. We were the first continent for this to be identified and then rapidly after um, Australia, Central America, Europe. And I'll just focus on these species. So since 1980, we've lost nine of our 260 species to extinction, 5%. Currently about 50 are listed as threatened on the National um, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, top left is the gastric brooding frog, two species, and these other frogs are called day frogs, frogs that used to be active by day, didn't have to wait to go out at night and see them, they hop around like grasshoppers on streams. Um, all started in 1980. Um, now, uh, it was about a decade before biologists got a handle on what that was about. Um, and at that stage, uh, I was working in South Australia, and uh, in fact, I was working on ratus, um, native Australian rats and, and plaguing and agricultural sort of problems, but kept an interest in frogs, mainly because of my earlier work on desert burrowing frogs. And this little frog here started to go extinct, the sharp snouted day frog. And uh, there were all sorts of hypotheses out there. Uh, because declines were being observed globally, people were looking for a global cause. Um, the hole in the ozone was brought up as something that could be causing this, but frogs are active by night, like, and they lay their eggs in, in dark streams in the rainforest, like, didn't make sense. Synergistic um, uh, effects of uh, pesticides and herbicides in the atmosphere were put forward. There were a whole light range of hypotheses, um, and so uh, along with a, a, a colleague, um, we knew this frog was declining and we went to one of the streams where, where its last stronghold was. We set up this experiment. So this represents a waterfall here. We took polypipe from the waterfall down to um, a series of tanks, a simple sort of um, aquaculture setup. And we put tadpoles and frogs that came from the stream into the tanks. Now we did this in eight sites, so we replicated it at higher and lower altitude in the ranges in North Queensland where the frog was found. So this is sort of like in environmental science of saying, well, the animals that are dying from whatever's causing them to die, and we had a hypothesis that it was disease, but we couldn't prove it. So we said, well, we'll put the animals in the environment that's killing them and watch them. It's very hard to do on a stream, so we'll enclose them in these um, mesocosms and and watch them every couple of days, count and watch what was going on. So that's, the animal is called the sensitive end point. Um, ethics committees, uh, no, 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 <laughs> um, anymore. You're not allowed to do a, an experiment like this, uh, um, or you'd have a great deal of difficulty getting it. And so what we actually discovered as we watched the frogs is that yes, they did die, and we saw sick and dying frogs and so we discovered what was the smoking gun, that disease was responsible, but we couldn't identify the disease. What, uh, what was most critical to us was to get some of these animals to major zoos into captive husbandry so they wouldn't go extinct. We moved um, tadpoles, because the uh, Queensland Department of Environment would only allow us to move tadpoles, not adults, to both Melbourne Zoo and Taronga Zoo. And it was the vet at, at Melbourne Zoo who identified a, what he thought was a protozoan, a single cell flagellated organism that was killing the frogs. Um, at that time, everybody would have thought a single cell with the flagella was a protozoan. Happened to be a fungus, which is a single cell flagellated organism. And it's a fungus that was killing the frogs. Uh, vets and other people got involved and eventually uh, um, a mycologist, a fungal person from North America, um, did some genetic work to identify the, the part of the, the fungus family tree that the disease came from. The disease was introduced to Australia. We don't know how, it wasn't deliberate, but many of our frogs were susceptible to it. And those that had small ranges and were susceptible went extinct. And they all did that within the first decade. This is, um, this is uh, what it looks like. It's called 
by the terrible name Batraca chytrium dendrobatitis. You'd know that the French name for frogs is Batrachians. Dendrobatitis is um, South American poison frogs, which also died. Um, it embeds in the skin, produces um, asexually with spores, uh, and there's nothing we can do about a disease in wildlife. It's, it's a major challenge, and this is not the first disease that wildlife will deal with. Um, so, in Australia, lots of our frogs are threatened. Lots of them are susceptible. And at that stage, so we now come to the sort of second or third part of the talk, um, we've seen the diversity, we've got a sense of what scientists are dealing with, and, and now the role of citizen science. So, um, at this stage, I was at Newcastle, and in fact, it was almost impossible to get the Australian Research Council to fund, um, not almost, I can think of this, the number of grants that we put to the Australian Research Council to study the disease, that were totally told that this is not a reality, um, and there's nothing that can be done or should be done. It was the weirdest thing. Um, but anyhow, I um, made a, a, a strong association with this organisation called Earthwatch. At that stage, they were run um, from Massachusetts in, in North America. And they are one of the first citizen science promoters. It's a big thing now. Like almost every day there's a new project. Like the, the news this morning had a new citizen science project being announced. Um, they're happening all the time asking citizens to get involved. Earthwatch was doing that back in the 1980s. Their model was to put keen volunteers into the field and to support field biologists doing their work. Um, now, uh, people paid, um, particularly people from the Northern Hemisphere, for their airfare and their accommodation and food to come and help a scientist. Um, in North America, the North American government um, in the US would enable their citizens to claim a tax deduction for their environmental con contribution by being a team member for Earthwatch. The Australian government regarded Earthwatch as um, ecotourism and would not um, a allow people who volunteered to claim their money back for transport and the like. Anyhow, I don't know how many, I sounds terrible, but between the 1980s and um, right up until I retired, I, probably like an average of five or six, or no, three or four teams a year for 20 years. Um, and some of the people who are here tonight, um, so Andrew and Karen, probably went on 20 or 30 teams as assistants. So I quite often use PhD students, and I mean used, <laughs> no, they loved it, um, to come and help me in the field and work with um, Earthwatch teams. So what's an Earthwatch team like? Well, it can be um, school kids. Um, this is a, we used to run uh, family weekends where mum and dad would come with their kids to meet Australian frogs and at the same time we were trying to collect data and, and also had just wonderful, great time with um, uh, volunteers. We ran high school teams, um, normally year 10, 11 and 12 students. Um, and uh, once again, I you know how many high And once again, across the whole of Australia, um, teams, students would come. And uh, with WWF, we train conservation scientists from Southeast Asia. So they took um, people who are rangers or conservation um, professionals in Asia, and they came to Australia. And for two weeks, we would train them in the, the techniques of field ecology for frogs. So this is a group of Asian students, uh, of Asian um, volunteers uh, in a campsite up in the border ranges. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about great Asian cuisine <laughs> in the field. So what I call um, the rise of citizen science. And while we're always critical of government, um, we shouldn't always be, um, because Australia has and other countries have followed it, one of the greatest um, ways of collecting our data about environment, and that's called the Atlas of Living Australia. How many people know about that? Well, you guys better, or you're in... <laughs> Shame on the rest of you, no. <laughs> 
Where have you been? So um, for those of the scientists here, and quite a number of you, you'll know what NCRIS is. NCRIS is the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme. So the Australian government, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, realised that it's absolutely crazy in a, in a country the size of Australia that we'd that Sydney University would want a synchrotron and so would Melbourne University and so would the ANU. The government said, no, 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 we'll have one synchrotron in Australia. Everybody from any research institution can buy time and if your project's approved, you can go to the synchrotron. And the same happens with ANSTO for nuclear medicine and all the rest. So there are certain facilities in Australia where the government has shown this incredible sense and said, you know, we'll have one national facility so that we can build an important facility. So the facility they built for the environment was this atlas. And people think, an atlas? What is that? And, well, it's actually a portal for every citizen, not just scientists, not just um, field ecologists and consultants, to put their records in. It's a record database, but it's also an analysis toolbox um, we'll talk about that if we want, but um, then by law, every time a licence is given to a consultant to work and go into the field, their records must go into the database. If I apply for a scientific licence to do field work, all my records must go to the database. And by doing this, we now have this frontal portal, if you go in and Google tonight when you go home, put in Atlas of Living Australia, you'll come up with this. It belongs to you. This is a, an Australian website. And it now tells us how many occurrence records have been reported, um, how many databases have been included. You just have to write in there, Magpie, and it will map every Magpie record in Australia. You want to write in there, City of Newcastle, and then you say all endangered species and then say for 20 kilometres around it will map all the records of every endangered species within 20 kilometres of Newcastle. If you then want to go into some analysis tools, um, search and analysis, you can then start to construct models um, using some fairly heavy algorithms on machine learning about what determines where a species is and why. You can query declines. And so while the word atlas seems funny, it's actually an amazing database which has great environmental value for planners, developers, the agricultural industry, forestry, because we have one portal with all our environmental information. It includes soil, vegetation, climate. Um, it's, 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 it's absolutely amazing. So. Um, this is citizen science in, at a big scale. And if I go on from there, what I've noticed in the um, sense working with Earthwatch, and as I say, right from the beginning, I regarded that as very much an on-ground citizen science. We were involving citizens, and their model was to put people in the field to help scientists. Um, there is now a vast number of projects that are called citizen science. Um, they occur in natural sciences, astronomy. There's an interesting one in soil science in Australia where you can get a Ziploc bag, bag up a sample of your soil and send it off. A couple of weeks, they'll send you back an analysis of your soil and tell you what toxins are in there, whether you've got pesticides. And what they're doing is mapping the whole of Australia's soils by offering a service um, and the citizens are collecting the samples. It's just amazing. So we now have over 130 million observations in the Atlas of um, Living Australia. There are some interesting things. When I started off talking about our problem with frogs as disease, only about 2% of them are invasive species. People think, oh, they're not important. It's a cane toad or it's a horse, uh, you know. Um, not that horses are invasive unless you're in Kosciuszko. Um, uh, and why? Why do most people who do this do it? Because they love nature. They love our native plants and animals. Um, and in the case of invasives, they may not realise that 
it's important to report where feral animals are. Um, and so there's a lot to be done for the, the Atlas to communicate with the users to say, please send us information on invasive animals as well as the natives. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, sort of front and centre right now that we tend to think that our biosecurity is just dealt with at the borders, um, but it's not. Um, like right about now, there's a fungus that's affecting Australian um, eucalypts and their relatives, the, mot the Motaceae, which is the major um, dry plants group of Australia outside of rainforest. There are some critical ones in the rainforest. And a, and a fungus that affects their leaves has come from South America called myrtle rust, and it's spreading across our country, and it could kill a great percentage of the trees in our forests. Right? And most of the public don't know this. Um, and like the disease that killed the frogs, there is nothing that we can do for wildlife diseases or fauna diseases, fauna and flora biotic, biota diseases. We can't go out and inoculate. We, like the last, the last chance for many of our frogs is to bring them into a zoo in captive husbandry and quarantine where they don't get the disease. Like, they're the living dead, as some people already put it. Um, and it's happening all the time. Uh, you think how much effort it took and how long it took for our species to understand HIV, SARS, um, and um, COVID. If the disease is in animals, we don't even... They don't come to, to the doctor and say, oh, I'm not feeling well. What's wrong? Somebody's got to be watching. We've got to have surveillance... It's a completely different ballpark. And that where, that's where the atlas is critical because scientists are interrogating that all the time, saying, uh-oh, something's happening in a certain part. The scientists out there, the citizens are not reporting, seeing something, or they're reporting some invasive. Um, that brings us to probably the most successful citizen science program that I'm aware of, and it happens to work with frogs. It's this thing called Frog ID. And it's, I think it's a citizen science project of its time. Uh, this was actually funded by the, once again, by a grant from the federal government. And it was the Natural History Museums of Australia. It's run by the Australian Museum, but to be fair, this was a consortium of six museums that said to the federal government, we would like to work on developing um, an app for frogs um, that the citizens can use to report the occurrence of frogs in their local area. And um, IBM offered um, in-kind support to develop the app and the, um, the, the computing, so that was wonderful. There was a big company involved. So what, what Frog ID is, is you download onto your phone a free app, just look up Frog ID, and because your phone is really an amazing tool, we all know that. Oh, eBird's a bit the same. We'll talk about that in a moment. But your phone is these four things. Sometimes you switch off, no, I don't want anybody to know where I am, or you say, yes, allow the app to say where I am. But your phone's a GPS, and it's incredibly accurate to within five metres in most across most of the country. It's also a very good camera. It's also a sound recorder. And most importantly, it's connected to the 5G, 3G, whatever network, and it's got storage. So what, what, are, the, what are the major technological um, developments in phones? There's small batteries, solid state storage, no longer a reel-to-reel -reel tape, and a great little camera. And all of that miniaturization of electronics, optics, microprocessors, solid state storage, they give the citizen, all they have to do is say, there's a frog, press the app, take 30 seconds of the call, press submit, it goes straight up via the network, like their phone networks, it's not a special satellite, it just goes straight across the 4G or 5G network. That goes to the Australian Museum, Somebody the next day puts the headphones on and listens and writes down what's there. 
They send back the information to the citizen scientists to say, this is what you've got at Bolwara in your backyard. And you go, fantastic. So they get a reward. They send out a newsletter saying who sent in the best. It's all promotional. Who's the lead submitter? Da, da, da. And uh, they give out rewards like that. There are now a million records submitted to Frog ID. One million observation. No permanently paid scientist with a team of 20 PhDs could do that. And so Frog ID does that. What's the future? The future is actually back at Bird, eBird, if you're a birdo. Any birdos? No keen birdos? This app goes one step further. Behind the app is artificial intelligence. This works for the whole world, not just Australia. You hold out your phone when you download this, you press record for five to 10 seconds, kookaburra, and back on your phone a few minutes later comes a photo of a kookaburra and says, we think you've found a kookaburra. Have a look at this photo. Does it look like a kookaburra? Yeah, it is a kookaburra. And that was done by AI. <clears throat> So no, no person was involved listening to that. In between the pressing of the recorder is a, a computer database which is churning through things like the frequency of the call, the number of pulses in the, in the amplitude of the call and identifies it as kookaburra. So the next thing that will happen as Frog ID is there won't be a team of people listening and writing down what you've got. It will be done by artificial intelligence um, on some computer. And that's where we're at. So why does this work for frogs? Because frogs um, call. You can only use sound um, when you've got something that makes a noise. And frogs and birds do that. Mammals don't. The technology for mammals is around camera traps, they're called. Lots of things setting off um, cameras and then it's... Um, if you're aware, there's another app called iNaturalist. Submit your photos and experts will tell you what photo of what mammal it was. Same story, GPS tells them where it was, what it's likely to be, and then the data all ends up on the atlas. So frogs call. They have this thing called a vocal sac. Um, and then this is what the app's working on. If it works. Maybe one more press. No, we'll go back. Technology always does this to you. Come on, can't hold my hand still. Oh, well, we won't listen to the sounds. So, so the students can make the noises. Um, the challenge is, of course, that some make an incredibly soft sound. This, this frog literally just goes, oh, oh. and something down here is going, wah, 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 like really loud sounds. And, um, but I'm having trouble like holding. No, it's not working loud enough. Let's not worry, because we're running short of time anyhow. Um, I was mainly going to say, play the sound so you got a sense of the variety that occurs and it's diverse. So to a great extent it depends on the fact that almost every species of frog has its own call. Like every bird pretty much has its own signature call. Some of them are very close to one another but they're called species specific calls and that's because frogs identify their mate by a species specific call. And so scientists and citizen scientists can use that as, as a true signature. And these are frogs all within 100 kilometres of here. These are local frogs. I've not chosen pictures of frogs from way away. These are all in the Wadigan Mountains or the Barrington Range. Um, the little guy on the right, common in ponds around town, little leaf green tree frog. Uh, one quite famous on Kurigang Island that we've worked a lot on, the bill frog, an endangered frog locally. Um, students are currently working on this frog called Little John's Frog, um, critically endangered, sadly, because of the chytrid fungus. Um, and Newcastle Uni and Alex and her team are doing captive breeding and trying to understand um, how 
we may save these frogs into the future. So we have this incredible diversity of beautiful frogs. And okay, um, I would like to bring you to then the next disaster uh, after disease, and I, I think you all know that um, the time of man brings with us climate change. And if there was a wake up for us, it happened in 2019 20 when 8 million hectares of um, uh, the East Coast, mostly in New South Wales, burnt in the most intense and severe fires that we've ever seen. Um, in this report, uh, WWF uh, estimated 2 billion animals perished. I wrote the, um, and did the analysis of the frogs and we estimated 50 million, um, which is much lower than many of the other groups, but we followed um, a precise method from what we knew from field counts. Still 50 million animals perishing um, it's just unbelievable um, in terms of the frog. And after the fires were over, um, we then led um, a team um, from multiple agencies and institutions. University of Newcastle was the lead institution, but we combined with University of New England, the Australian Museum, State Forest Corporation, because they manage a large amount of our forests, and Department National Parks and Wildlife, and then the Federal Department of Environment Water. Um, and um, we really said, well, 50 million die, but what happens to the survivors and were they able to re reproduce and what's happened to their environment? Um, the outcome of our study, so this is what the fire scar looked like around Sydney. Um, aerial, uh, so... Um, sort of satellite interpretation and the deeper the colour is the more intense the fire. Intensity is, is, is um, quantitatively measured um, as, in, as is severity. They're two different things to fire ecologists. I won't worry about it. Uh, what did we find? Uh, so the only science that's heavy in here tonight, sorry. Uh, we set up what's called a batchy design. So this is before, after, control, paired experiment. So we took the atlas to tell us what was before. We had the fire and then after it was after. So this is a comparison before and after the event. Um, and um, we used control sites that didn't burn as well as sites that obviously burnt. So we had 180 independent field sites. Uh, we used replicated surveys of those. We just didn't go to the site once. We did a minimum of three times. We used a thing called occupancy model, whether the frogs occupy the habitat or not. And we can determine what probability we have in our field surveys to say we miss them or not. One of the great problems with frogs, if you're not there the right night, you might not find them or hear them because they depend on the rain. So you can do a lot of surveys and if you're not there the night it rained, well, you won't detect them. They're very cryptic. So there's a statistic about the prob probability of detecting, which can be built into our model. We covered from southern New South Wales right up to Queensland. And we did 80 sites with a thing called sound recorders. So instead of just us walking there, um, it was a lot of walking for our team of people, um, we set up sound recorders. Now, these are not like the phone. These are just a little solid state um, memory device turns on five minutes every hour and records the sound. And we left some of those for three months in sight, some up to six months, but particularly in spring and autumn, spring to autumn when frogs are active. So we ended up recording, for all of that, um, 120 hours of sound. So how do we actually listen to 120 hours? Um, so Andrew there is the citizen scientist who listened to hundreds of hours of sounds. But we also used an algorithm-based um, software, which I won't go into. You, you can ask software to do this. If you've created what are called recognisers, you've got to tell the software what it's listening for. Uh, it can't do it by some magic. Uh, what we found was evidence of significant declines and disappearances. Um, as an end result of that, the, the federal government has uplisted five species to be critically endangered as a result of that work because of the fires. 
and they're now listed as endangered on the National Threatened Species list. And you also come across other things, and I would like to be able to, um, because Andrew alerted me to this um, from our recordings. God, save us. And the Teco is coming to help me. Yeah, should we go? Or should we read off? Turn it off and back on, yeah? So just, just poke on that. Yep, very loud. Yep. Thank you. Should have asked him earlier, shouldn't we? So not only do you hear frogs, of course, when you... So there's a frog in the middle of that, believe it or not. But that's a lyre bird doing its morning thing. And um, for many of our rainforest sites, that's what we heard. So we've actually got eight, 180 survey sites with the dawn chorus, the owls of a night time, um, an amazing database. And that was the frog. Do you hear the frog? There he is. But as Andrew also pointed out, it's a bird. Let's listen again. Hi, a bird? And it's copying a flute. And that song occurs across a large part of um, New England and then up on the north coast. And um, there's several scientific papers about it trying to understand how the lyrebirds and where they listen to a flute and how they're copying that sound. Um, it's almost note perfect. Uh, it's just amazing. That's a bit of amazing things that happen that you don't expect. Um, I can remember the day when Andrew came and he said, hey, listen to this. <laughs> this is just unbelievable. Um, so um, they're the sorts of things that uh, co um, conservation is linking with. Now he's going to keep doing that. <laughs> and I'll leave the last um, note to the frogs. The crazy chicken frog. Thank you very much. Wonderful and really uh, enlightening talk. I'm sure we all learned a lot tonight, except maybe the students. Maybe they know it already. Um, <laughs> They're not allowed to ask questions, George. OK, no questions <laughs> from then. But uh, perhaps I can start with a question. You, you mentioned the atlas and the, um, the um, frog ID. I wondered how, how long have they been going and um, how much more is there for, for them to, to learn, to, to add to the database? How much do you think they've captured? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think the Atlas has now been running some, oh, Karen, you know, 10, 15 years? Um, it wasn't in the first round of increase funding. Um, it's at least 15 years old, I think. Also, uh, um, over 20 years. Yeah. Um, so for the, the National Atlas, yeah, good period of time. Frog ID is only five years old or thereabouts. So it's relatively recent. It's been copied by so many other apps and actually 
other countries have um, looked at that technology and, and are adopting it. So, um, uh, so relatively recent um, for the Frog ID, a bit longer for the Atlas. How much more? Uh, look, there is an immense amount. I use the example of invasive animals and, and things like fungus. People, once the citizens know what to look for, I mean, I asked myself what went wrong with Varroa mite. Where was the surveillance and why didn't professional... Any beekeepers before I... <laughs> uh, why weren't professional beekeepers noticing that? What was going on in their management and their surveillance, given that it's a, an international you know, problem and that they are supposedly looking you know, with um, sentinel hives around the port of Newcastle and, uh, and other ports to know when it arrived? So something fell, fell down. But these are the things, so with myrtle rust, anybody who just has to lift up the leaf on a eucalypt tree and sees all yellow fungus on it can go, here it is. Yeah. And so there are so many other apps uh, for citizen science, which I think the development is incredible. Um, and the opportunities are incredible. They're, they're incredible with climate change. Of course, people will see... So an app I saw this morning in the southwest of WA where climate change most, most severely affects the Australian continent, it's the, it's, since 1970 the southwest of WA has been drying year in, year out. And it's got the highest diversity of um, banksias in Australia and many other flowers. People go to the southwest of WA for the wonderful flower display and it's dying. It's dying because of drought. And so they're asking citizen scientists, scientists to take photos of the bush in WA between about Shark Bay and around to um, Margaret River and Esperance to take photos of um, where they see dying forest. So the forest is literally dying of, 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 of thirst. And that happened in 2000 before the fires in 2019. There are parts of Western New South Wales where thousands of hectares of forest died. We, we don't get reported this very often. They died because of thirst. You know, the, the drought was so severe. Um, and in parts of the New England tablelands of New South Wales, we had the same problem. So these atlases are, are wonderful because they do connect the people. And the next thing is that they create, in a political sense, what's called a constituency. People vote. People who are informed vote. People who are informed because they get interested in something that they can do, they don't have to go far. You just go on holidays and take a photo, do this, do that. Everybody can do it. There's a bit of a mantra in conservation science, think globally, act locally. We're all frustrated that we can't do anything to change these terrible things, but we all can. We all can be involved in citizen science. It's an, you don't have to go out of your way. Some people get so enamoured with it that they go off and do it everywhere. You know, they're the top hitters on the, on the app and you get people to get right into it. Um, but everybody can do this. School kids can do it. Go on an excursion and straight away their data becomes history. It's recorded for all time. Sorry, that was a long... If there are other questions. Michael, that was the most enjoyable and engaging talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you were probably aware, I think it was less than 10 years ago, there was a road or a bridge or something proposed to be built up around Nundal, uh, up from Tamworth. Mm. And I think it was the Boorolong frog that was found mm. there. And the whole thing was held up. And I'm not too sure where it ended up, but Barnaby Joyce got involved. Bloody hell. What in the hell are you doing? There's people who are going to get up this road and are stopped by some friggin' frog. <laughs> Could you speak to Barnaby Joyce? For, <laughs> on a, no, I, I mean, here and now, <laughs> as, as, imagine I'm Barnaby Joyce, and tell me why it's important that this road does not go ahead. Um, I'm, yeah, thank you very much for the question. And it comes to the very hard, 
it comes to the hardest part of conservation science um, because as Barnaby opposed, it was the construction of the Dungowan Dam to heighten Dungowan Dam at Nundal, which supplies water uh, through to Tamworth and I suppose the cotton industry, I'm not sure where that water goes to. And um, yeah, uh, so what happened is they did their environmental impact study and found this endangered frog downstream and also upstream. And Andrew did surveys there for this frog many times. Um, beautiful name, the Burulong frog. There's a creek behind Armadale called Burulong Creek where it was first found. And Barnaby just said, what? I think he's quoted saying, what a bloody frog. We're going to build this dam. We need water. We need it for our agriculture. This is jobs. And so it's the classic, you know, clash between environment and, and um, development. Now, do your work. Go and find out where the frog is. How many are going to be affected by the dam? Is it irreparable? Are they somewhere else? There's all these other things to be thought about before you, you know, go crazy. Go through the steps. Find out. If it's the last population of the frog, and it wasn't in this case, but if it's the last one, then you've got a real problem. And this is an endearing problem in environmental science, and it comes up all the time. Um, and from a conservationist perspective, we're always on the end, the losing end. Our laws are almost useless. Um, if somebody, a developer's got enough money, and they will get it through and there are enough politicians and things happen. Um, and so how do, you, how do you compare the value of a frog compared to the cotton industry? And it's, it's almost impossible beyond saying, I give, you a, I give you a parcel in a box and I tell you I've given you something that is a, a precious jewel. It's irreplaceable. Man cannot make this. Nature made it. This is 80 million years old. It's, it's lineage, not, not imagined. It's tested by genetics. The last time it shared a common ancestor with a frog in South America was 80 million years ago on the continent of Gondwana. I, look, it's sort of like... Um, it's, it's sort of facetious to say, oh, I can't compa compare that to a Mozart script or a or a, you know, the Mona Lisa, they're, they're things created by man, they're beautiful, the Taj Mahal, we could go and build another one if we wanted to, we can't remake this frog, and that could be any other organism. It's totally irreplaceable. And then we go, well, is it? No, we've got 260 other frogs, we can lose one. And so that's where we're at, and it's almost, uh, it's a conundrum. You can't give an answer. We have laws, they're not strong enough. Um, but then we get the death of a thousand cuts. It's one, then it's two, it's three, it's four. To the, you come to the point, well, we've degraded our whole natural system. I mean, a lot of ecologists would answer that question and say, oh, it's connected, everything's connected. You take the frog, there's gonna be the insects numbers will go up, the water quality changes, da da da, -da. Everything is connected. That's true. But nine species have gone extinct. Our planet hasn't stopped. Australia hasn't stopped. The rainforest is still growing there up at Yungula where the gastric brooding frog occurs. To 90%, 99.9% of tourists who go there where that frog used to occur, the forest is still beautiful. It hasn't collapsed. This concept of everything being interconnected doesn't seem to happen at that scale. Um, and so all I think it comes down to the intrinsic value, my own personal view is, that there are times when we have to say the intrinsic value is irreplaceable. I don't know how you turn that into an economic value. Some people try. Really doesn't matter. Um, we don't have the right to cause the extinction of those intrinsic values. Um, put any money on it you like, whatever. It's simply morally not, not right to do. But as we know, we do many things that are immoral. Um, sorry, that's, um, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Mike, thanks for a really engaging talk. That was fasc fascinating. 
I just wondered, in the death of a thousand cuts, um, to what extent can reproductive technology help us to preserve some of that genetic diversity that we are losing currently? I think it can do a, a great deal. Um, I was quite deliberate when I said that E.O. Wilson, um, and people probably don't know who E.O. Wilson, he's a multiple Pulitzer Prize winner, um, probably one of the greatest environmental writers of our time, um, in the time of people like David Attenborough. Um, he died last year, he's an incredibly significant thinker. Um, and Wilson was quite deliberate in his quote, I'm sure, of putting in genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is mentioned in our Federal Biodiversity Act, but actually it's not acted upon. Um, we act upon threatened species, but we don't act upon degrading or loss of genetic diversity. And it's actually hard to get up amongst conservation biologists in the field. They don't get it. And I think that's because most of them haven't studied genetics. Uh, but so universities, um, so we're included, have failed um, a generation of, um, I think they just hated Mendelian genetics, John, and, and didn't want to go any further to, to modern bioinformatics and modern genetics. Um, and so uh, a colleague of mine, John Clulo, and myself, and then a bunch of students, and Roshan here, um, you know, we have created genome banks. We, in Newcastle, we hold the only genome bank um, of Australian frogs. That's cryopreserved frozen sperm. We can't do it for eggs. That's a research challenge. We can't do it for embryos. Um, it was funded by the federal government under the FIRE Act. They did accept that it was a valuable thing to cryopreserve um, the genetic diversity. And, and then to be able to use it. Most people, John, come back with wanting proof of concept. They say, show us an example where stored genomes have been used to retrieve. And we say, well, here's the example, the black-footed ferret. You know, it, it now exists and is back in, its, in nature because of sperm storage. Um, they still don't sort of agree with it. Yet at the same time, we have a nationally funded seed bank for plants that is well accepted, not questioned, but the concept of having an NCRIS facility for the genomes of Australian animals, no, no. Oh, freezing damage, I think. Crystal, so even if you, even if they're, um, you know, plunged immediately in and there's no, and people put in cryoprotectants and try, that. So there is some success with some fish, um, but that, that is the great challenge once, it's, once you've got multicellular space, really. Um, we don't have to have it because, um, as Roshan, look at Roshan, like Roshan this week cloned an Australian frog in the laboratory. You think, cloning, oh my God. No, all he did was just take one female and take its cells and put it into donor embryos and there's... There's five new frogs. We're not creating monsters, as some people in the media quickly come out. What about Hitler? You're bringing him back. No, we're not bringing <laughs> Give us a break. Give us a break, you know. Um, so there are lots of technical challenges in, in animal-assisted reproductive technologies, which we've not learned from human-assisted reproductive technologies. In some ways, the human egg and embryos ideal. It's small. It, both the sperm, eggs and embryos can be preserved of our species and most, you know, cattle like, you know, it's done commonly for sheep, cattle, horses, but frogs have very large yolky eggs and that's the real challenge. So, but trying to convince people that you should save genetic diversity, like this is like, you think, well, probably for where you come from, human reproductive biology, this is sort of a no-brainer, but it's not a no-brainer to conservation biologists. And there's one other very large lobby against us, and, and that's our allies. Uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature, any large conservation organisation say, no, don't tell the politician you can save a species in a, in a, in a, in a test tube because we've fought all our life to protect habitat. Don't give them the chance to say, 
What's the problem? These guys at Newcastle can tell us we can put all the genes in a bottle. We're not saying that at all either, but um, you know, you can see their, their concern. Um, yeah. Okay, I think um, we've cut them off. We have, I think we have two, two more questions, and um, or maybe three more questions. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, I was down in Tumut holiday a couple of weeks ago and I popped into the tourist information centre there and they had a little fish tank with some moss in it and there were some little, three little frogs, mm. they little black guys with uh, yellow spots. I think they were corroboree. Yeah. Mm. Do you know what the status is of those little guys? In the wild, um, uh, less than 50 in the wild, the biologists working on that say... They fluctuate between five and 10 and 50. I don't really know. They had reintroduced them into enclosures and they were all burnt during the fires. Um, so in the wild, they are declared essentially as extinct in the wild. Um, Taronga Zoo, Melbourne Zoo, Nadji Nature Reserve, there are three large colonies, so the, the species. What we've learnt from our earlier mistakes in when the disease was happening is we now know how to control the disease in captivity um, what antifungicides to use if it breaks out in a colony, what security you need. So the corroboree frog won't go extinct. It just won't be in its part in nature. Um, and so it becomes, you know, a, a triage case until we can get a solution to that. People are working on solutions, but there's, there's no short, you know, um, answer to that. It's big blue sky research to do transcriptomes, CRISPR, cut and paste anti antibiotic genes into a frog and um, millions of dollars of research um, to get a natural resistance. So I can't see that happening in the short term. Uh, there are about five frogs in that case, in that situation in Australia. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have a few more questions. Um, you said there are no short answers, but can you make Sorry. the answers a little bit shorter, please? <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I think the concept, so we, we don't even adapt, we mitigate, we build better air conditioners, better houses. The, the concept that an animal can adapt in that short period of time I think is fanciful. The answer is no, it takes millions of years of natural selection. There is some examples of Australian frogs that have adapted to the disease because they had some natural genetic diversity that enabled that. Yeah, sorry, that was shorter, George. <laughs> My question is from Biology 101. Um, we had an amazing evening of frogs and the other night because of the rain and the, the pond was just loaded with tadpoles. What percentage of tadpoles get to adult life and what happens to them? So 101 is um, about 5 to 1% to of them will make it to adulthood. Um, so 90, 90 to 95% will die before they reach maturity. But remember, a frog only has to have two individuals of its offspring make it, one to replace its partner and one to replace itself if it's mum. Two's enough to keep the population balanced. And, and the frog's game is lots of eggs, hoping a couple make it through. That's their strategy. Um, look, I, 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 I think of, I see this stuff about the, uh, the apps to, to put in your phone and to gather data. Um, I, I wonder where the, um, the information about that is. I think about people I know, some in person, mostly through Facebook and that, uh, keen photographers and that, that would would that love to do that. Uh, oh. Just as one person, I could hit a button and a hundred people would get so if that you information remember, straight away. But where do you, I get it? All you need to do is just go to Google or your search engine, write Atlas of Living Australia, and it'll come straight up as a as Stuff a Stuff about the apps will come and all that? Yeah. yeah. The Atlas okay. of Living Australia will come up. I didn't point it out. You'll see there was a part on the banner that says students and citizens. Um, so they work ah. with you know, all sorts. Frog ID... Once again, in Google, just write frog ID and that app will come up. eBird, write eBird and up will come information about 
downloading the app. They're free. You don't pay for them. They don't take much space on your phone. Um, sure, I can think of lots of people who'd love to do it. And for, photo for photographers, it's called iNaturalist. Little I. Write the stuff down so it's yep. just gone. Goes yeah, OK, I can write it other. on a piece of paper for you. That's fine. Oh, yeah. I'll do it when we're finished, yep. One more question. Thank you. Um, I think m uh, my questions have already been answered in part. I'm concerned about the persistence of the lethal organisms such as the fungi and the... I, I know that other viruses are affecting uh, alpha frog population. But... Um, and I'm also concerned that if you are able to develop protected populations, how long must we wait before they're going to be safe in the, in the, in the wild again? I mean, it's, unless they get some... Is there work going on looking at um, um, ways to respond to the, for say, the, uh, the, the fungus in particular? The, um, is yeah. there work? How, how persistent is it? Uh, it's incredibly persistent. The worst thing about uh, a pathogen is that it's not specific. Most pathogens are, are species specific. The thing about chytrid fungus is it affects pretty much all frogs. And so some frogs are resistant, but they then become um, the carriers of the disease. And so it's tighter is always high in the environment. It also lives in the mud and the dirt and streams, not continuously. So it's in the environment and it's kept high in the environment. And that's its greatest challenge. I mean, when it first appeared, there were several experts in wildlife disease and disease in general said, oh, a disease can't force an animal to extinction. And you go, well, it's nine of them are extinct. And they say, well, it just doesn't happen. And you say, well, why, why has it happened? Because they were thinking of the cases where something species specific. In that case, it's very hard for a disease to force its, its host into extinction because it can't find enough of them when they become really rare. But if... If you've got many hosts and it's an environmental disease, then this is not a problem. Is something being done uh, at Newcastle? We've done a lot of work on what's called environmental mitigation. The whole of Kuragang Island is an environmental mitigation site for the bell frog, where the disease doesn't like salt water, but the frog can handle a bit. So we created saltwater ponds as compensation for the coal loaders to save the frog. And what, what's happening there is that the disease itself has its own environmental thresholds, and we, we worked outside of that. Um, big picture, uh, so uh, a month ago, published the genome of one of the frogs had a photograph on there, uh, a, a frog who's recovered from the disease. Six loci for antimicrobial peptides in that frog, so genes secreted in the skin of the frog which fight any invader. And when you think about it, a frog like all frogs have got wet skin. Why aren't they loaded with bacteria and everything? You leave a bit of wet meat out, what happens? It's, everything's attacking it, but frogs, no, clean skin. They, for millions of years, have developed means of fighting anything that lands on them and tries to grow, but not chytrid. Um, so this frog's evolved that resistance. So geneticists have identified genes that they could cut and put into the susceptible species. That step is not a minor step. That's making transgenic animals. It's got a lot of other ethical issues to consider, apart from the, the lab work, which is not minor. Um, but So there is blue sky possibility, but you'd have to do it for each individual frog species that was threatened. Then you'd have to breed them up. Anyhow, um, and George said, I've got to be short. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I think, um, let's, uh, let's give us some applause.